Hi, I'm Rachel Edden. And I'm Miles Stokes. And we're the hosts of Rachel and Miles Explain the X-Men, a weekly podcast all about the ins, outs, and retcons of our favorite superhero soap opera. We're also the hosts of Rachel and Miles Review the X-Men. Which you're watching right now. Where we talk about the X-Books that come out each week. Today we're going to be looking at the week of June 9th, 2015. Let's go for it. We'll start off today with Inferno Number no. 2, written by Dennis Hopeless, with art by Javier Garon, and colors by Chris Sotomayor. So we really, really liked Inferno No. 1. And this uh, is an excellent, excellent issue, but I don't think it's quite as strong as the first one was. And for me, the reason for that is that in the first, we saw, you know, sort of both sides of this, this part of Battle World. We saw the part inside the kind of demon dome, and we saw what was going on in the sort of outside world uh, that the demons had been, had been segregated away from. This time, it's entirely inside the Inferno, and we also have the main characters, you know, Colossus and his squad, totally split up. And so while it is really cool to get to focus on each of those characters, I did kind of miss seeing, you know, the team dynamics we saw in the first issue. Yeah, this is a book whose overwhelming strength early on was all about the interaction between its characters and returning, as you said, to dynamics that we'd seen first in Hopeless's Cable and X-Force run. While, again, it's going in really intriguing directions, it's a little bit of a letdown to not just have a second issue of that stuff, but I'm also reluctant to judge it based on that because I realize that it's kind of me going... A series I love ended before I wanted it to end, and I just want that back instead of something new. Right, and that's going to be the conflict, I think, with a lot of these Secret Wars books. It's like, hey, there's all this awesome nostalgia, but we also want a new thing, and those two can kind of uh, get in the way of each other sometimes. That said, what we do see are some great new character dynamics. We have Colossus hanging out with Madeline Pryor, the Goblin Queen, a whole lot. Mm. And my favorite, we have Domino hanging out with... Well, not exactly Cable. I mean, it's basically, you know, Cable if Nathan Christopher Summers, the baby in Inferno, had grown up and still ended up techno-organic and obsessed with guns. Well, and grown up with his mother, right, specifically. Right, with Madeline Pryor. Which is weird, because for Inferno to have taken root that hard, he would have had to have been sacrificed, wouldn't he have? So that's, you know, kind of a paradox. But, well, it's only know. issue two. Who knows? <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, it's it's really definitely fun. Um, the art, Javier Garon's art, is just a perfect fit for this book. Very cartoony, very exaggerated. We have, like, you know, subway entrances and street lights that themselves are demonic faces. We have very expressive characters. It suits, it suits the book very well. You know, you describe this book as fun, and I kind of want to talk about that a little bit, because this is a book that has a lot of potential to go deep into grimdark and the original mm -hmm. crossover that it came out of really was was very dark very heavy very sort of at the most intense possible intersection between soap opera and line spanning horror mm -hmm. except excalibur excalibur except was just excalibur. fun and this book is fun and it's silly and it's got all of those elements and it's got a clear thread from what it's based out of but a very different tone, and I'm really enjoying seeing seeing Hopeless and Garon run with that. They're a great team for, again, I mean, what what Hopeless in particular is known for is taking kind of the grim dark, dark books and finding a lot of humor in that without losing track of the source, source material. And I think he's done a really great job here and continues to. Agreed. This is a very solid Secret Wars book. I mean, I'm not going to say it's the best of the best, but it is actively very, very good. If you're an X-Men fan, if you liked Inferno at all, or if you just like some of the characters in here, it remains a book very much worth picking up. Next up, we've got a story from Secret Wars Journal number two. This is Hell's Kitchen, written by Simon Spurrier, drawn by Jonathan Marks, and colored by Miroslav Merva. Now, we've talked some about what we are and aren't going to review here, and our definition of what counts as an X story is nebulous. This isn't an X-Men story, but it is one that features Mr. Sinister, and it's also one that we really like, and it's also one that's coming at the end of me marathon reading 30 Years of Daredevil, so we're reviewing it whether or not it's an X story. Mm -hmm. Hey, and it's by one of our favorite X-Men writers. Yeah, we are noted fans of Cy Spurrier, somewhat divisive. We love his work. Uh, and speaking of loving his work, oh my god, this story is good and it's weird and it's dark and it's exactly what I want from Secret Wars because it's taking characters, paring them down to very core concepts, utterly removing them from their context from their original context and comfort zones and having those relationships and sort of core dynamics and themes persist. This does that with Daredevil, it does it with Elektra, and it really does it with Mr. Sinister. It's creepy, it's cool, it's incredibly good horror, mm -hmm. and it's visually gorgeous. And this is all coming from a premise that is truly ridiculous. We have Bar Sinister, one of the battle worlds, run by like 
endless clones of Mr. Sinister, a living conceptual virus, and Daredevil is his cook with enhanced an enhanced palate. Well, and, he has senses in general, but that one particularly amplified and played out. Yeah, and Elektra, like, hunts for rare foods, and it's this kind of romance, revenge, horror story. Well, and it's dark mm. and screwed up in all of the ways that Daredevil and Elektra stories are and should be. Yeah. Too. It, it, that, that dynamic and the weird paradoxes of the, that dynamic persist fairly beautifully. This is, despite, you know, the, the premise doesn't make it sound like it, but this is Spurrier, I think, about as toned down as we've seen him on a Marvel, Marvel book. Yeah, the weird is very much there, but really it's a kind of serious story about desperation and loss about, you know, a chef working for Mr. Sinister. And the art is really beautiful. It's moody, it's evocative, um... Marx is a great choice for it, I think, because he really beautifully straddles the styles of two of the really definitive Daredevil artists, um, Mac and Malieve. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's a great story. And this is this is also, we're not going to review it, but I want to say, if you're going to pick up an issue of, War, of uh, Secret Wars Journal, this is a good one to get because the other story in it is also just superlative. It is absolutely not an X story, but God, it is so much fun. Killville is a battle world based entirely on 80s action movie logic. I have nothing bad to say about that. Also, any story starring Misty Knight is good by me. One time she punched a shark. And last for the short week, we have X-Men 92 Infinite Comic number 2, written by Chad Bowers and Chris Sims, with art by Scott Koblish and colors by Matt Milla. I question whether we can ethically review this comic at this point. Right, I mean, Rachel, you just claimed last time that Chris Sims is one of your best friends, yeah. and well, we'll get to the reasons why this one were even more biased. Yeah, this is, this is, I, I think this is kind of taking us to a new level of conflict of interest right now. Right, but first, the book itself. So, uh, with X-Men Infinite Comic uh, 92, X-Men 92 and Infinite Comic number one, we saw a comic that was very clearly heavily informed by the animated series of the 90s. And I was kind of wondering if it was going to go in that direction in general. But with this one, this one is just pure early 90s X-Men glorious nonsense. Yeah, when Chris and Chad came on the podcast to talk about this series, one of the things they brought up was that they were trying to, to have it be inflected from both the animated series and the comics of this era. And boy, do you start seeing the latter. But there's also one of the best animated gimmicks that I have ever, like, I, I love... I love the animated gimmick that shows up in this in this issue. I don't know, was it, would it be spoiling it to discuss it? Uh, no, I think it's legit. So Cassandra Nova, who's the villain of this arc, is basically broadcast standards and practices. Yeah, so there'll be certain lines, then they'll be crossed out with a BS and P notes saying, you know, like, no, that word's unacceptable, replace with, or always say, and it's great, because if you've read much about X-Men the Animated Series, that happened all the time. That's why, you know, you see Wolverine drawing his claws, and then just, like, wrestling with people on the ground, rolling around, or people talking about destroying each other all the time. Yeah, you can't say kill. Um, and that's such... A great idea for an antagonist in an era that's specifically all about over-the-top conflict and violence mm -hmm. and all about you know dialing things up to 11 to have a telepath who who basically is is reinforcing and all about enforcing the rules of social propriety correctly or otherwise um, and speaking of Cassandra Nova I feel like there's something we should we should we should mention <laughs> we, we mentioned conflict of interest uh, this issue features a large number of cameos most of them are X-Men characters two of them are us yeah, we're, um, we're canon, guys. <laughs> well, we're, for uh, a very specific value of canon, this is a Secret Wars battle world country, so... I'm counting it. We're gonna have entries in the Marvel database. It's gonna be great. Yeah, we're written in as, uh, and we're drawn in as well, uh, as henchmen of Cassandra Nova, and, um, I, ten-year-old me, his head just exploded, thus creating a time paradox, splintering <laughs> off a parallel reality. It's fairly amazing. So, yeah, our, our review of this comic is even less bi or even even less objective than our review of the first issue. Mm -hmm. We're in an X-Men comic, you guys. Seriously. Uh, We're villains, too, which I feel like is really appropriate. We, we are. Would be. <laughs> um, uh, well, specifically, we're the new Harvey and Janet. I'm just saying. You were not the only one to say that. That was actually when, when Chad emailed to ask about that. It was The title was Harvey and Janet 92. There so. you go. <laughs> um, anyway, the comic itself, uh, it, you know, it continues to be both a loving homage to early 90s X-Men comics comics and comics in general, and also a gentle poking fun at. So for somebody like me who grew up with those comics, you know, that was my first era where I was buying my own books, it's perfect because I look back to how much I love those comics, and I also look back with a little bit of, oh, my taste was a little iffy, huh? So best of both worlds there. It's a really fun comic. Um, of course, this one remains uh, digital only for the moment. We're going to get the first print copy coming soon. And that said, if you are choosing between digital and print on this, I would actually go digital over print. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because you get it earlier. 
But in larger part, it's because this is a comic that actually makes pretty clever use of the infinite comics medium, where having the digital transitions adds a lot to the experience of reading it and adds pretty significantly to the storytelling. I think it's going to work fine in print, but I think you'll get more if you're reading it digitally. So those are our two and a half books this week. Rachel, what's our favorite? Well, inclined as I may be to just dive full force into X-Men 92 Infinite Egotism, um, I'm actually going to have to go with Secret Wars Journal number 2 because it is a fairly precise distillation of everything that I wanted to get out of this event. It's two stories with characters radically removed from their original contexts, but preserved in kind of core ways that I find really fascinating. And which are also both just really, really good, pretty much unprecedented stories. It's what I want from an anthology title, and it's what I want from an event like this. I would ask what our panel of the week is, but I feel like that one kind of almost goes without saying. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned not uh, falling into egotism with the issue of the week. We're totally going to fall into egotism with the panel of the week. Because fact, really, look at these style, look at these stylish, stylish people. Right. I mean, in fact, we're going to give you two different options. You can either have our first canonical appearance as Marvel Universe characters, or the first time we're named. So, you know, we don't want to play favorites or anything like that. That is it for this week. Thanks for watching. If you like what you've seen here, please check out our podcast, Rachel and Miles Explain the X-Men. New episodes go up every Sunday at rachelandmiles.com, also on iTunes and Stitcher. What do we got from them this week, Miles? This time, it is some really heavy and really good new mutant stories. Mirage fights death, Cannonball takes Lila Shaney home to meet his folks, and a lot of very tragic and well-written things happen. Um, that episode, this video review, and everything else you'll see at rachelandmiles.com come to you courtesy of our awesome Patreon subscribers. We are an entirely ad-free and listener-supported project. If you want to join the ranks of the folks who make those things possible, you can do that via our Patreon at the link either above or below, depending on where you're watching this video. In the meantime, if you can't stand the heat, stay out of Sinister's Kitchen. Really, just stay out of Sinister's Kitchen regardless. It's a terrible place. Don't go there. I am actually, I'm deeply jealous of your sweater vest. How come you get a sweater vest? I, I don't know. I mean, that wasn't my idea. You'll have to ask, uh, ask Scott Koblish, I guess. It's a good sweater vest. I would, I would, I would legitimately and unironically wear Miles 92's sweater vest. Uh, Miles in this universe says that Miles in that universe will lend Rachel in that universe his sweater vest. Okay. That, I, okay. Mm-hmm.